So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Seti. So this is actually the second time I've had the pleasure of speaking to Fresno High uh, before. This uh, first time was several years ago, and this is a really, really great showing that I have here, a much larger showing today. So I'm really excited to be able to talk to you a little bit about this process. And you know, I am a composer, and I've been writing music for the better part of 20 five years now, so I'm starting to feel a little old, I suppose. But uh, that's, uh, you know, how I got to Fresno State was as a composer. Um, but I also uh, study music theory, all right, and uh, do a little musicology research on the side. And what I want to talk about today in particular has to do with kind of the intersection of how composers decide, make decisions, you know, when they're starting a composition, how do I decide to write the note B versus the note A, or why do I want to use this tempo versus that tempo? And to start that, I want to kind of take a look back at music history and really consider some compositions and why the composer chose perhaps to write the piece of music the way they did. This is going to start with a fundamental question that we have to kind of address, and this is a really big kind of philosophical question that goes in music, causes real large arguments, fist fights among musicologists. I'm, I'm serious, actually. They get really passionate about this. And uh, the, the issue is basically, is music inherent in its structure? So let me play, you know, for example, do you know when I play a piece of music? I'm going to play something for you. I want you to tell me if you think this piece of music sounds happy, or sad. It's all quiet. just take that much here. So what do you think? Who thinks that that was a song about real joyful, cheerful elements of this person's life? No one. Who thinks that this is a really sad, something horrible is about to happen here? Yeah, a lot of you think that, right? Okay, well, why? Okay, it's a minor key. We have some musicians in the room, right? No difference between a major key and a minor key. Um, but why do we think a minor key is sad and a major key is happy? Is it because someone once said, I'm going to make major keys happy sounding and minor keys sad sounding? Is there something inherent in the music, though, that makes us associate something which is major as happy, or in this case, something in a minor key is a sad piece of music? And that's the question here. because. There's a, you know, people will debate this about whether or not there's an element of the music built into the structure that says a major triad is built in our consciousness. We, we hear that as something uplifting, something that has an openness to it. I'm not going to get too technical here, but it has in part, partly the way to do with the notes themselves, how they're structured. You have a big one on the bottom, a small one on the top, and that helps elevate it, if you will. Or perhaps it's none of that. Perhaps it's our culture that determined that a major triad, major chord is happy and a minor chord is sad. Is it the music itself or is it our culture? Okay, and that's really an interesting question there because there's no one definitive answer about this. You know? Now, I can tell you this music is sad. We hear it, it definitely sounds sad. It's slow, for one. It uses that minor key. It also has all these lines going down. Did you hear that? The bottom line, the bass line is moving down, downward, downward. And even the, the vocalist herself, she's singing a line which has this sigh figure to it. Ah, da -da, da -da, da -da. That's it's a musical sigh, as it's often referred to. And it's the same as ah, kind of doing that. All right. Well, that's another element. That's actually tied specifically to speech. The idea that we're mimicking speech patterns, and if we think 
when we are sad, we go low. When we speak low, and when we're happy, we uplift our voice, you know, get higher. All right. So that might, that might be something that we consider as well. But we can tell that this is a sad song. Okay, from a compositional perspective, that gives me information. I can say, all right, well, minor keys are sad. Slow pieces might be sad. Descending lines might be sad. Whether it's the culture which is determined that that's the case, or the fact that there's something built into the music, I'm going to let people smarter than me argue this, okay? But I know that those are elements that I can work with, okay? Let's look at a couple other examples, other pieces of music which have very specific elements built into it. So the second one um, is called the Surprise Symphony, all right? So there's a musical surprise in this, and I'll let you figure out what the surprise is. Caught a few of us off guard, right? So there's, this is Haydn. If you know Haydn's music, he's a little bit of a joker, all right? I actually have for you a real life picture of that being composed. <laughs> right there, okay. So that particular work, all right, is, it gets the nickname the Surprise Symphony because of the way that that is written in there. And of course, you can see in this little cartoon that the dynamics the fact that it's so quiet, so subdued, so boring, really, in a way. That's very boring music, and Haydn knows it's boring music. And then you can insert this really loud chord there at the very end to create a sense of surprise. We don't normally associate the music of Haydn as very emotive music, music that has a lot of happiness or sadness associated with it, because that's not something he was so interested in. He was far more interested in you know, a piece of music just having a good structure. You know, it was classical. But this clearly is that humor that he's putting in there, saying I want a little bit of a joke in this, and he's using this element of quiet and loud as a way to pull off that joke. And while we always know that sad keys, minor keys have that sad quality, major keys have that happy quality, putting off humor in music is a lot harder. Humor requires something perhaps unexpected. So if we continue with this trend, we continue to kind of look at some of these other elements that are put into this music here, okay? A few other examples. Let me go back over here, all right? So in the same time period, roughly the same time period that Haydn is writing his humor, all right? Composer that came a little bit after him, in fact, one of his students, Beethoven, Okay, was starting to write music that was trying to be a little more complicated. Maybe there were sad moments in Beethoven's music, but maybe he didn't just want to make things sad. Maybe he wanted to make things tragic. He didn't just want to make happy music. He wanted to make joyful music. And so he started to kind of consider different ways that he could incorporate that. So we had this really complex movement in his Seventh Symphony, which is fundamentally what we call a dirge. And we know what a dirge is in music? And we know that? We know uh, marches, right? You know marches. Well, a dirge is a march for a funeral. You know, so <laughs> that's a, a happy topic, right? You know, a funeral march. And very common actual, um, element in a lot of music, we have this idea of this funeral march. But what's unusual about this particular funeral march is its tempo. When you hear this, you'll hear its minor key, so it's sad, but it's not slow. So loud as, loud as it gets. So 
So it is a quiet start. If I let this go a little further, I'll change it here. Right about here. So that particular work right there, even though this is still designed to be a piece of music which is mostly just about the structure that's being created, it's part of what we call a symphony where there's no real program, if you will, towards it, Beethoven is very interested in still conveying this idea of a funeral march, this idea that it's a, you know, something really stoic in a way, all right? And yeah, it's sad, passionate, but the tempo is peculiar because it's faster than you would expect it to be. Most funeral marches are like this. Ba 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 ba. So he's making it faster. Why would he do that? A lot of conductors disagree. A lot of conductors take this way too slow. All right, and you actually take it at his marking. It's a faster piece than you expected. So that's really interesting. As a composer, you have to ask, what is it about it that he wanted to make faster within this music? And part of its pace that the movement becomes bogged down if it's too slow. Now, if you take it as a true funeral march, it gets really boring. And so it's like Beethoven's trying to kind of keep this a little more interesting, keep it a little more moving. And so he puts it up at a faster tempo, all right? So even though it's meant to be something that's somewhat sad, it's meant to have this echo of a march, echo of a funeral march, he's also making it something which has a little more motion to it. All right, so not all music though is trying to just be about the music itself using a little limited knowledge that we have of, you know, major is happy, minor is sad. Eventually we get to a point where we really start to try to tell stories with our music, try to tell images with our music, try to convey other elements, programmatic elements that we can incorporate within our music, okay? One of the more famous examples of this is uh, Modest Mazursky's Pictures at an Exhibition. Anyone familiar with this piece? Got a couple hands here, all right. So picture that an exhibition, really well-known composition that was modeled after real paintings, all right. That Moss Mazursky sees these paintings and, you know, and decides he's going to compose piano pieces. Later on, another composer, Maurice Ravel, took Mazursky's piano works and made them for the orchestra. And those orchestra versions are what's quite famous. And we hear those frequently. And uh, you know, you may or may not have heard the, uh, what we call the promenade of this. This is the promenade of pictures on exhibition, but then I'm going to play one movement for you in the accompanying picture. So, oh, here we go. Oh. This is supposed to present the person in the promenade just walking between the paintings. So you have the paintings, it's almost like you're just kind of inside the museum, walking through it. At a walking tempo. So that kind of music is interspersed throughout the whole piece, but what I want to tell you about is music that uses this lovely image. All right. You can take that in for a second. Very bizarre picture, right? You know, 
Uh, the music that is taught, that's uh, the unhatched, chick chick unhatched chicken, right, is what we have here. And we have the ballet of the unhatched chicks is the movement that comes off this. So how would you write music for this image? I want you to think about that for a second. All right? Do you think the music would be happy, sad? No, neither of those really work anymore, does it, right? Okay. Would it be slow or fast? This is a lot harder now, isn't it? Because we have a lot more choice, a lot more decisions that have to be made because this is just bizarre. Right? You look at that and go, I, I don't know, it's kind of nightmare music possibly, I don't know. Well, let's, let's hear what uh, we actually come up with in the music. I'll, I'll leave the, it's a really scary painting actually. <laughs> so. So, oops. how would you describe this music? Does it match what you thought it would be? Maybe? Maybe you're familiar with this? What's a good word to describe this? Quick, Quick choppy, flowery. flowery maybe? I think playful. That's where I think of a little bit. There's this kind of like playful characteristic to it. Now, this is what's interesting. Some of you looked at this painting and were terrified. I'm looking at the, the, the face of Mr. Setti's face, and she's, she's mortified from this, right? And I think of is, is how are you dancing into that? <laughs> right? like, can you imagine trying to move in that thing at the tempo? Seriously, right? <laughs> but what's interesting is that part of this is also from our own cultural lens. Okay, we talk about the issues of how we associate certain musical meaning through our own culture. And while there are some universals in music which may be tied towards the music structures, our culture changes. And so when we think about this picture from the turn of the, between right at the beginning of the 20th century, turn of the 20th century, right, like 1890s really is what we're dealing with here, all right? And the fact that Mazursky's writing at a very different time, all right? He's looking at this painting here, and he's seeing probably something relatively innocent. Okay, this child dressed as a chi as, just as an unhatched chicken. All right, kind of an innocent costume here. You know, I think too many horror films may have ruined us a little bit to some degree. You know, when we look at this, but you know that perspective is very different when we consider it from a 19th century. Now, it doesn't take much longer until we start to get to that more kind of dreadful horror culture in the 20th century, and it's actually only a decade or so away when we get to German Expressionism. And uh, you know, you think of uh, Monks the Scream, you know, that painting, very famous painting that we have, and composers of that period where they start to capture a lot more imagery of anxiety and terror and dread. And you get music which also matches anxiety and terror and dread. You get compositions which, I'll show you the music first, and for those of you who can read music, we have this Nacht right here, and I've circled on this, um, I have my lightsaber, right? So, uh, you know, but if you can see where I've circled things, this figure here, all right, is a figure which shows up over and over and over in the music. And we get a little bit later and you start to see those figures all throughout the piano part, buried within the piano texture. And if you can't read music, don't worry about it. What you can see here is that it starts fairly thin. Right? You see fewer notes here. And as we keep going, you get more notes and more notes. And this is because the, the text, which is in German here, is talking about Finstre Schwarze Riesenvater, dark, black butterflies blotting out the sun. 
is the actual X that we have here. And we get the image of the music notes actually blocking out the page as things get darker over the course of this particular song, which is Nacht, night, is what is being described here. The music is appropriately dark as well, very dissonant, very difficult music. I'll fast forward a little bit. So the singer's not even really singing. It's like a sing speech. start hearing it get thicker, but there's this anxious anxiety behind everything. So, it's a little bit of Arnold Schoenberg, by the way, and if you're not familiar with his music, his music can be very challenging to listen to, but it's also representative of that time, this time of just very, you know, anxiety. It's the same time of Sigmund Freud, and so, you know, this is what's popular in Germany at the time, all right? Um, as we move through the 20th century, the resources that we get to kind of convey different ways of approaching music becomes a lot larger for one main reason, and it's that we actually have all of music history to draw from now. All right, and that we start to also get to a point where composers don't only write music based upon their own ideas, their own concepts, their own thoughts, but they also say, well, I can create an idea in music referenced off of music from the past, right? This happens actually a lot in popular music where you might hear a new piece on the radio and they're remixing someone else's tune. They're remixing a song. And they're doing it sometimes to make a comment, you know? They might say, I'm remixing someone because I really like them, or I'm remixing because I really hated them, all right? <laughs> they bring it in and try to, to make that commentary, all right? Um, I want to play for you, first of all, a brief moment of a piece of music by composer Schubert from the early 19th century. This is uh, from his Death in the Maiden Quintet. Not because, I, but I want to use that just so you know what the piece is, because we're going to then hear what a later composer did as a way to make a commentary on this particular work. So this is the uh, Death in the Maiden Quintet, right here, quartet, sorry. No, older music. Kind of sounds like the first piece I played in a way. All right. So, I'm gonna let this play one more sec, a few more seconds here. So it's important to put this in context because this is an incredibly well-known movement of string quartet literature. So um, if you are someone who's into string quartet music, you'll probably know this. And if you're a string player and you play in a quartet, you'll more, most definitely know this. So it was important that when this particular music shows up later on in a work by composer George Crumb, American composer, um, later part of the 20th century, in his composition Black Angels, 
All right. It's interesting because, well, first of all, both pieces are about death. All right. But Black Angels is probably a much harsher look at it, if you will. But he's taking this earlier composition built upon death and making a much more overt comment on how we perceive death in our modern culture. Also worth pointing out is that the uh, composition Black Angels, the larger work, is for electric string quartet, not just string quartet. So it changes a little bit of how we perceive it. Really quiet. Apologize for how quiet that was, because it's an exceptionally little quiet moment, and the, it's hard to get it louder here. Um, what you were hearing, though, was that same movement, but only three of the four players were actually playing it. The fourth player, the first violin, was actually imitating a fly buzzing around the room, as if it's a corpse, degrading, all right? And uh, it's a really na kind of like gnarly image that's being created by the composer here. All right, but that fly buzzing around is really kind of a fascinating element, and that's what the violin just playing really high, really kind of tinny element to make it sound like that. And um, while this quartet particular performance didn't do that, um, what's actually written is that the players who are playing the remaining portion of the uh, quartet are actually slowly getting flatter and flatter and flatter, as if the actual music is decaying in the process. And so it's this real kind of overt imagery that's being created within the music. All right. So this was just kind of a brief kind of overview of the many different ways that composers kind of um, take elements of what we know in music and try to apply it towards the compositions. But what I want to do now, at Pivot for the second part of this, is talk more directly about how, as a composer, I would apply this. All right? And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, pull up my uh, virtual whiteboard. So put this back up. Let's go just to a blank page here. Got a pencil, there we go. All right, so this will work here. Unfortunately, I have to keep this plugged in, I think, so I don't think I can walk around too successfully, can I? Well, maybe, I got a little bit of a cord here. I don't want to trip over it, so maybe not. We'll just leave it here. I'll probably be safer that way. Uh, otherwise, I'll maybe you know trip over my own cord and create a disaster here. So, okay, so what we can do, though, is kind of start off with this basic idea of almost mind mapping out a piece, all right? Where if we start with, you know, kind of a basic concept of what I want my composition to be and kind of work from there. Now, some composers, they like to work off of just a musical idea as a way to get started. I like to really start with this notion that I have a core central concept of what I want everything in my composition to be, all right? And that's the first thing I'm going to talk about here is this idea of having a concept. Okay, so what would be a good concept to work off of? Let's brainstorm this for just a brief second. It doesn't need to be anything too serious here, just an idea, something I want my composition to be about. Any volunteers, any ideas? What should I make a piece about, a music about? We've heard a lot of pieces about death today. All right, maybe not death, maybe something lighter. What do we think? It could be anything. The sky. All right, let's try that. We can make a piece of music about the sky, okay? So if I'm going to make a piece of music that is trying to reference the sky, okay, what would be elements that I might want to consider to help kind of broaden this out? What would be the next steps? Well, I have to consider a multitude of possible things here, including, you know, what do I want my 
tempo to be? How fast or slow do I want this composition to be? What instruments do I want to use? All right. How large a piece is this going to be? All right, how small, it's the size, overall scope of this piece. Um, I think if it's something about the sky, wouldn't it make sense for there to be ideas which rise in the music? I think so. So maybe I'd write in here over the side, I want rising ideas. All right, pull a question mark because I'm not sure yet. What tempo do you think? What, if I'm wearing a piece about the sky, you think it should be a fast piece, a slow piece, or maybe somewhere in between? Somewhere in between. What? You think fast? Like a, no, like a drowsy feel. Oh, a drowsy feel. Something that's kind of like slowing down a little bit, possibly. So maybe this isn't just about the sky. Maybe there's something else that's making me drowsy. What, so is it the sky getting darker? Like a storm coming in or something. Oh, okay. That's even better. All right. So we can actually build, build this so it's not just about the sky. Maybe it's uh, stormy sky. Okay, that changes a few things, right? So while I might have this idea of the sky, maybe a storm is moving in, or maybe, maybe it starts calm. And then it starts to get stormier as I go, all right? That gives me a great direction. Let me pause here for a second. One thing that we have to deal with when making a piece of music is that music is inherently an art in time, okay? And that no matter how I structure my composition, I have to deal with the fact that it is going to exist over a period of time. Now there's two things I can try. I can try to make this a piece of music that goes like this. Here's the beginning, here's the middle, here's the end, all right? We think of that as a linear composition, that we have, there's a definitive start, maybe it starts as a clear and sunny sky, and then in the, over the course of the piece it gets stormier, it has a break, and then it breaks out into the sun again, pops, possibly. That would be a pretty typical kind of linear approach. Or maybe, Nothing in the composition actually leads from one place to the next. Maybe something else is governing how that overall structure is working. That's what I'd call a nonlinear piece, where you know what happens at the start of the composition, not necessarily the beginning, just where I start it, just where I choose to start it, has some, nothing to do with what happens at the end. It just things happen over the course. Maybe I'm trying to make a picture of the sky in my music. All right? I still have to think about it in time, but I might be able to kind of think of it almost like this impressionistic cross-section of music over the course of the time. All right? So those are some things I have to consider. But I think for what we're describing here, making it something which starts, starts kind of like clear, moves towards something more stormy, and then maybe moves towards clear again, would give me direction of the approaches that I might want. Okay? None of these elements are necessarily fixed. My tempo could start slow, and then get faster, and then get faster still, and maybe I end really fast. My instruments, that's more fixed, all right? Once I've established what the instruments are that I want on the stage, I kind of have to stick with that. I have to say, that's the group that's going to do it. So if this is going to be a piece about the sky, maybe I might choose to have instruments that give me a lighter characteristic. Or maybe I've been told what the instruments are. Maybe this is for a specific group. So I have to kind of make those decisions as well, all right? Everything that I'm doing here, though, is a decision based upon my initial concept. And the concept that maybe I start with, the sky, okay, it's really just the tip of the proverbial kind of pyramid that I'm creating here. I have to spend a lot of time not just saying what that concept is, but how does it broaden out? What else feeds into that concept? How does the piece change over time? What is the piece at minute one, at minute two, at minute three, at minute four? All right. These are all different possibilities that have to be considered. Only once I have broadened this concept out enough to the point where I feel comfortable knowing what that piece of music looks like at all points in time, do I now feel like I'm in a position where I can start to make larger decisions about things like pitches and rhythms and harmonies, you know, the things that we think music is, right? Okay? It's, 
trying to make music without any sort of kind of idea of what I want this composition to be is like trying to like reach into a bag of 500 jelly beans and pull the only purple jelly bean out of the bag. All right, blind. You know, it's almost impossible to do. You might get lucky. You might find the exact notes you want. But really, it doesn't work like that. We don't get struck by inspiration and just wake up one day and say, aha, I got a melody. And that doesn't happen. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's like, you know, we want to make that the way that music happens. But it doesn't. What happens is we work off of ideas and concepts. And we work off of it over many, many sessions of work, sometimes weeks of time, possibly months, so if it's a really large piece, although hopefully not if you have a deadline, but uh, you know, enough time that you can start to make the ideas match the concept that you want this work to be. All right? So the concept is the first thing that you have to have within your composition. Okay? This ties to a lot of art. You know? If I'm going to make visual art, it's better if I know what I am creating visually than if I don't. Right? I mean, maybe it's abstract. Maybe I'm just going to do a study in color. But if I'm going to do a study in color, what, is my in, what, what am I hoping to do with that study in color? All right? If I'm doing a composition, which is a study in color, again, same thing. All right? How do I make that happen within my music? All right? So this goes into, with my studio, we do a lot of talk of pre-composition, about this process of taking your time to figure out what your piece is, spending large amounts of time writing with pencil and paper. All right? What I usually have my students do, you know, for, especially for those who really get into this, is I, you know, as you see, I fill, I'm filling up the screen pretty quickly because it's you know, not a very large screen relative to my finger. So what I usually do is we work off sheets of butcher paper. And you go get large sheets of butcher paper. And you write relatively small on that butcher paper so you can have room to work because you don't know which direction you're going to go when you initially start this. All right, let me go to a, another screen here. Okay. That's at this. All right. So I start with my concept. All right. And that concept may give me meanings, things that I want to incorporate within my music. Okay. As I said at the very beginning of the lecture, maybe that concept gives me the idea that I want this to be an overall sad piece or an overall happy piece. That's oversimplification, but that's the general idea. All right? From there, all right, how do I then grow that composition with my music? If I want this to be something which is more or less sad, possibly it's going to be in a minor key. Or maybe I'm using notes which translate into that emotion that I want. It's a little more complex than that, and usually it is. I mean, again, to keep it simple, the concepts will lead towards the meanings that I'm trying to derive, and that leads to the musical ideas. That's going to lead to my tempo choices. That's going to lead to my harmonic choices. That's going to lead to my pitch choices. And most importantly, it's actually going to lead to the rhythmic choices. Rhythm is actually probably the most important of all of these because that's the one that we feel the most. That's the surface level, if you will, of the music. Okay? So, what else do we need to make this happen, though? Okay? If you're going to compose any sort of music, all right, you need a concept that you're going to build off, okay? You need time, right? If you don't have enough time to work within this, you're going to not necessarily have a good composition to work from. All right, so it always takes time to do this. And a lot of that time is spent figuring out how you're putting it together. It's not simply, I have a week to work on this, and so I'm going to start at the beginning of the piece and work on my way. It's not a good approach. A better approach is to say, I have a week to work on this, so I'm probably going to have to spend at least that first two, those first two days trying to figure out what my concept is, what I'm developing from that concept, how deep do I want to get into that concept, and then I start to create my musical ideas based upon that. And maybe those musical ideas are broader than simply I start at the beginning and go to the end. Maybe it's something that tells me where I start in the middle of the composition. Maybe the concept tells me how I space ideas out. Here's an interesting concept. 
What if I want to make a music about pi? No, not that pi, this pi. So if I want to make a piece of music about that, Okay, sorry, bad joke, I know. It's a, we had Pi Day a few days ago, and that's what was on my mind. Anyways, um, you know, I mean, when we think of the, you know, you know uh, tri approximating the first few digits here, okay? How would I incorporate this into a composition? Well, I have a series of numbers. Numbers in music are great because we have that surface rhythm that we work off of, and I can take those numbers and apply them to positions within my music. And so a very transparent way of approaching this might be to have an idea that takes three bars of music, followed by something that does one bar, followed by something that takes four bars, another one bar, five bars, two bars, six bars, okay? That's pretty heady in a way, but it's a direct translation of this concept into something tangible within my music that goes beyond simply making something which is a happy idea or a sad idea. I wrote a piece of music several years ago, about uh, five years ago, I want to say, six years ago, all right? And I wanted the music to be based upon a kaleidoscope, all right? Who, have anyone ever looked inside a kaleidoscope before and you see all the different kind of things spinning around, right? And if you actually look closely at the mirrors, the way the mirrors are operating within them is you have three different mirrors. Okay, and they're all reflecting the elements in different ways to give you the imagery of the kaleidoscope. So how I incorporated the kaleidoscope into my composition was I used three different musical reflections throughout the movement. I started with a progression of notes and then I reflected those notes using three separate intervals and you know, the music I used as a, a third, a fourth, and a fifth, all right? And those reflections showed up at various times based upon, again, a mathematical process that I put into play. That idea alone generated for me nine minutes of music, all right? Which is quite a bit of music, actually. It ends up being a really long section. And the sections themselves had this very kind of spacey, almost organic quality as they moved from idea to idea not to idea. And while you could hear that they were related to each other, because they're kind of all reflected off of one another, they all sounded a little different each time. Different mirror images, the way a kaleidoscope kind of operated. Okay? And so that's how I use something kind of strange, like a kaleidoscope, to come up with a musical structure from which I then developed further and further and further things into. Okay? So that was the concept. It, that particular piece, though, took me, in terms of time, about uh, three months to compose, all right, for nine minutes of music. And that's pretty normal, actually, to have to spend, you know, two, three months to compose roughly ten minutes, unless you're a film composer. If you're a film composer, you're generally writing about 75 minutes of music a month. It's grueling. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's a different career entirely, though. But uh, uh, so you need time in order to be able to get your ideas to work out correctly, all right? What else do you need? You need concept, you need time, okay? You need theory, okay? Who here is in music, study music theory a little bit? I've got a few people, the same people, <laughs> all right, okay. Um, you know, it's like we try to write music and like any other discipline that we work in, there is a structure built into that. And I'm talking very generally today, but the actual building blocks of music are fairly complicated. And you know, it takes study to learn this. And if you want to write music, like any discipline, you need to take the time to really understand that, those building blocks. Not so you can recreate them exactly. You know, a lot of music theory classes spend a lot of time having you, teaching you how to write like Bach. Bach is great, but we want to write our own music too. But if you know how to write in that approach, you also know how to break it and how to make the music melt, as we just heard, or at least attempted to hear with the, uh, the George Crumb example earlier, all right, where the music kind of faded away. Knowing what makes music normal then gives us the ability to make music that perhaps sounds less normal. Knowing that certain ideas in music have a tendency to sound satisfying helps us then when we want to make music sound less satisfying. 
composer Igor Stravinsky was really good at setting up that expectation only to kind of pull the rug out from under you, or if you will, all right? And that kind of play between setting up your expectation and then making a choice. Do I want to satisfy your expectation, give you what you want, give you the resolution that you're expecting, or do I thwart it? Do I do something else, all right? That I can only do if I know what is expected, all right? If I'm flying blind, then there's no way that I can make that happen. So that's why theory is an important part of a composer's knowledge, all right? Even if sometimes it can be kind of grueling to get through, and it can be, you know? Uh, but knowing how that building block works gives us the ability to then do that, regardless of whether or not we think that the music that we're creating is inherently built into our, our knowledge, that we know that, as I said earlier at the beginning of class, whether it's built, a major chord is always going to be happy, or if it's, again, through the cultural lens that tells us that a major chord is going to be happy. Now, going back to that, circling back all the way to the beginning of what we started with here, okay? I just want to address that fundamental question, you know, again, this idea of does the meaning of music, is the meaning of music then built into its structure or through our culture? Do we associate an element in music because that is how it's built or is it because that's how we're told? All right? As I said, I don't have a good answer to that because that's something that smarter people than me are going to debate. But what I do know is that I can use this knowledge that this exists to create a good piece of music and to create a piece of music that thwarts your expectations or at times satisfies your expectations as needed. Okay? The argument for the structure is simple. Okay? When I have a musical note, okay, I'm going to use C1. Okay, I don't have a keyboard here, so I can't play the piano necessarily, but you know, if you know in music, we have uh, A through G is the music notes, and so C is kind of a basic note, all right? There's a bunch of other notes which are created when I play that note. All right, I play C, and what you actually hear in that is more than just that one note. You hear what we call overtones. We hear other parts of that, okay? And in that, those overtones, Okay, I get another C, I'm going to call it C2, all right, because it's one C higher. I get a G, another C, and then right here, in that series, the fourth, fifth, and sixth note, okay, create C, E, G, which you know, if you, you know music, that's our major triad, okay? And so when we hear that one pitch, that major triad that we talked about is actually built into it, okay? The minor triad doesn't come until later, okay? So there might be a reason why we are built to hear a major triad as something satisfying, as something happy, because it's actually built into every single note that we listen to, all right, on a low level, on a subconscious level, okay? However, there's absolutely nothing in that series which indicates why when I play, you know, really dark descending music lines, that that's giving me a feeling of oppression, all right? Is that built into the music or is that a cultural element? Is it the fact that that very first piece of music that I played for you, she has this musical sigh in there. Is that the music or is that the fact that she's sighing, something that we expect in our voice? that piece of music with the dark butterflies, right? Okay, we're looking at them as images of butterflies right now, okay? That's not the music so much, that's something that the composer put in there, okay? So maybe there's a little bit of both here, that some parts of the music itself have that inherent ability to communicate a, something we always expect, that music that's major tends to be happy, you can take it a step further that certain keys have, me have meanings. 
you know, different music keys, key of uh, D flat minor, sometimes referred to as the saddest key of all, versus something like G major, which is supposed to be a very uplifting key. I, I actually don't prescribe to all that, but there are people who make, you know, like to argue that the different keys have their own feelings, their own emotions associated with them. Okay? Or perhaps the elements of music itself are so ingrained in our ears that we hear them over and over and over and over again that we just know what to expect. We know that when we hear a film score, okay, and we hear a melody, I'm going to have to load this up because I didn't have this in um, right away. Well, no, that's okay. Uh, when we hear certain melodies in film music, all right, film composer has to know inherently which melodies are going to convey which emotions, because that's their job, right? They have to know directly what the culture thinks a melody about innocence is supposed to sound like, right? So that way when they create a scene with a little child, you don't think when you're seeing that child that something is, you know, horribly wrong. Unless something is horribly wrong, maybe it's a you know, horror film again, right? That's the power of where the musical culture side of things come in. That if we understand what we expect as a listener, all right, that becomes a manipulation where what I see on the screen may be reinforced or perhaps, no, we, we, we sense something is wrong because of the music which is associated with that, if I have that scene of a child, as I mentioned, and it's nice, uplifting, happy music, you know, something's pro it's probably just a nice scene of childhood. On the other hand, if there's something kind of scary in the background music-wise, the music is descending, the music is minor, possibly, maybe we know something is wrong in that case. And it's conveying us, again, that musical message that's coming within that scene, okay? I have a few minutes here remaining, and I want to make sure I have an opportunity here to open up for questions. Just um, any questions, whether it's about what I'm talking about today or writing music in general. Happy to answer questions about that. Um, so I would like to open up the floor at this point to, to give an opportunity for questions. Yes, please. Um, I just wanted to ask what inspired you to pursue a musical career? And what, what's your name? That's right. Talia, nice to meet you. So I um, started writing music in, I think it was 11th grade when I started really write music uh, actively. And part of it was because I had played jazz for a really long time. And I always loved the aspect of creating music and wanted to kind of look further into that. I got into music theory primarily as kind of a side of music composition because, you know, as I started to write music, I wanted to know more about how it was structured. And so, um, you know, I continued to study music theory throughout my entire college education while learning composition. It also didn't hurt that as a graduate student, that was my first kind of paid gig as a musician was teaching music theory to the undergrads. So that uh, kind of go, went along with it. So that study, though, of music theory is always a part of what you do. And I, I think most programs in music composition today, um, at, at the graduate level at least, are theory and composition programs. And so they're often kind of entwined. Um, you'll see a few programs out there where they're not, but most of the time you kind of see them hand in hand. Other questions? Yes, sir. Have you seen any in different time periods or eras of music? Have you seen like different overarching themes that each a composer of the era may have like made similarly. So you mean like one composer doing similar things or like like yeah, many composers at the same time? Yeah. Oh yeah, oh absolutely. So I'll give you a good example of some of that. So um, if you go back again to Haydn, you know, and go back to the classical period, this is a time of mu and music where they're not trying to convey a lot of emotion within the music. It's supposed to be much more about kind of a, a structural idea that we, we think of the music in its pure form. And yet, Despite that, there's this style of music that shows up in most classical composers, including Haydn and Mozart, um, as well as many you know, other like Stamets and uh, Weber. And it's called Sturm und Drang, Storm and Stress, which is the style that they put in there. And it's this, this idea of this music which gets really kind of 
well, stormy, dark, minor key, and really kind of aggressive. And it's, it's featured by what, with a lot of these like strings going like this, tremolo strings, really fast, agitated textures. And you know, if you, one of the great examples is um, Beethoven, a little later, wrote in his Sixth Symphony, a little storm and stress movement, which was literally a storm being portrayed in, in a pastoral scene here. And so despite this period being all about classical structure, many of the composers of the time were all writing the storm and stress. Why? Because it was a trend. It was popular, right? It's kind of like today, if I look at composers today, all right, a lot of composers are trying to do really, really different things, but the one thing I see showing up in almost every composer's output at some point or another is some incorporation of technology into their music, and in particular trying to incorporate electronic dance music beats. You see a lot of classical music being written today. So it's kind of fascinating. So yeah, that, that definitely they show up. Yes. What do you think of the Beatles composition? Beatles are amazing. You know, I mean, I know I've talked a lot about classical music today, but I love popular music too. And uh, Beatles are some of the best music artists of the 20th century, bar none, all right? And they learned over time how to write music and how to create compositions because when they started, they were just a boy band. And it was curiosity that made them want to pursue different ideas. And that's actually a really good thing I want to kind of leave here on. I know that we may have more questions, but I want to make sure to get this across, that if you are at all interested in writing music, all right, I wrote up on that board, I wrote that you need an idea, a concept to work off If You need time to make sure you can make this happen. You need to have some basic of theory, but the thing that you need more than all of that, honestly, is curiosity, all right? That you need to be curious and willing to try different things and just experiment and see what happens. Because what's the worst thing that you do? You, you try something that doesn't work, Oh well, you do something else, okay? So the Beatles were curious, and that curiosity led them to create revolutionary ideas in music, all right? Their curiosity may have been stemmed from other things, but that, that's okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll go there, all right. Other questions? I think I'm uh, seeing the time here, but I want to thank you all very much for giving the opportunity to present here today. It's a pleasure. Thank you.